This will be an in-depth critique of the newly released Legend of Zelda game Breath of the Wild. If you have not watched my previous videos on the 3D Zelda games, I suggest you go watch them before watching this video. Most of those videos could be viewed on their own, but this video will heavily reference many of my established Zelda opinions, so it may be helpful to receive that background before viewing further. Unfortunately, the nature of my videos require me to spoil almost everything about a particular game, and since this game is newly released, I want to offer this disclaimer in case you may not have played it yet. I won't be shying away from spoilers, so if you're particularly sensitive, please come back to this video after you've played the game for yourself. If it helps, I don't discuss story elements until much later in the video. It would seem many people think Zelda has an identity crisis, and I certainly wouldn't blame anyone for feeling that way. In many ways, I'm inclined to agree. Despite my positive reception of most 3D Zelda games, it's hard to deny how much the series has changed since its inception. The franchise got its start in a virtual sandbox of sorts, a world that prides player agency above all else. The ability to explore a virtual space freely, a near limitless set of options. You boot up the game, pick up a sword, and you're left to your own devices. Travel restrictions are placed by the player instead of the game. The player gets to decide whether they want to get lost in dangerous territory to discover something new. An equal opportunity exists for the player to explore safer territory if they so choose. The key word there is choose. Zelda 1 gives the player a crucial tool for this type of adventure, choice. This profoundly simple tool influences progression, difficulty, discovery, all neatly wrapped under the blanket of a heightened sense of agency. That philosophy is a relic of an era long forgotten. Each game since the release of Zelda 1 put another nail in the coffin as the series continually distanced itself from this idea. A Link to the Past introduced a dungeon order, Ocarina of Time introduced the companion character and a more story-based progression, The Wind Waker forced a linear sequence of dungeons, and Skyward Sword took story-based progression to the extreme and prioritized a full sense of knowledge regarding this linear sequence. Whether it's inherently damaging or perfectly reasonable is up to each player to decide. My favorite Zelda game has always been Twilight Princess because of how well it handles its linear progression, how easy it feels to relive that epic adventure. I criticized The Wind Waker for botching the Great Sea, attempting to prove that an idea can only be done right by its execution. I'm sure you can deduce which side of the issue I take in this debate. But can you really? Can you pinpoint a time in any of my videos on the series when I expressly stated which side of the debate I fall on? You can't, because I exist in the middle. I don't believe there's a specific philosophy that works better for Zelda, because Twilight Princess has proven itself a worthy adventure despite its linearity. It's so good at setting up an epic adventure that I don't feel patronized for following a set objective, nor do repeat playthroughs suffer because of it. Though, I do acknowledge the weaknesses that come with this approach. A lack of choice, a lack of freedom, a lack of agency. I've always wanted a 3D Zelda game that would once again embrace these long-forgotten ideals. Despite how much I still enjoy playing something like Skyward Sword, I admit that it's on the extreme edge of this linear progression, and that's largely to its detriment. Breath of the Wild is a return to this philosophy. In many ways, a modern vision of Zelda 1. If you don't believe me, I implore you to watch the documentary series on Nintendo's YouTube channel and the GDC presentation held several weeks ago. This game wears its heart on its sleeve. So then what is that heart? Where can we find it? Well, not in the Wii U version, I can tell you that. Breath of the Wild's development started for the Wii U, so in many ways it was intended to be the definitive version, but that's far from the reality. While graphically it isn't a huge step down from the Nintendo Switch port, the performance gap is ridiculous. Areas that are more populated, like Kakariko Village, suffer a variety of drops below 30 frames per second. Even worse, populated areas with special effects such as rain tank the frame rate further. If we look at Zora's Domain, which is always raining, the frame rate hovers around 20 frames per second. 
Admittedly, these drops are usually in safe environments. I can't say the same when fighting a horde of enemies. If too much is going on in a battle, the frame rate will tank, and this is where most of my issues reside. If the game runs poorly when you're in a dangerous situation, it's easy for a horrible frame rate to impair your judgment. Unfortunately, unless you're in a one-on-one -on -one encounter, the frame rate is rarely consistent. Additionally, I find the removal of the gamepad-specific features to be disappointing. Some of the first footage Nintendo showed of this game featured a map on the gamepad screen, as well as the ability to tap sections of the map to create an in-game waypoint. Based on the 3D Zelda remakes, you would assume the inventory, quest log, and other options would also be on the gamepad for ease of use. You might be surprised to find out the only function of the gamepad is to enable Off-TV mode. The screen displays a text blurb telling you how to activate Off-TV play, and that's it. I hesitate to call this a lie, since video games often discard elements of their game during the development process. Standard practice for the industry. However, in this case, I find it suspicious, because there is no harm in having gamepad functionality. Especially when several years ago, the features seemed to be working fine. You'd have to imagine something like that would make it into the final release, but it didn't. I don't wish to spark a conspiracy theory. Yet, I can't shake this feeling that corporate Nintendo made the decision to scrap the gamepad features so that the Nintendo Switch version wouldn't appear inferior. I have no way of proving this, though the GDC presentation I mentioned earlier leads me to believe there were a few decisions out of the hands of the dev team. They even received an email nonchalantly informing the team they had to begin work on a port for the Nintendo Switch. Do with that information what you will. Regardless, the Wii U version of the game is severely underdeveloped, and it's clear the Switch port is what Nintendo wants you to buy. I mean, why wouldn't they? It's the flagship title for their new system. Of course they want to make the Switch port as sexy as it can possibly be when compared to the Wii U version. It's just a shame the Wii U version was stripped of some potentially great features that could have made excellent use of the gamepad like the Zelda remakes before it. At the very least, maybe then the Wii U gamepad would have gone out with somewhat of a bang? The Switch version is a technical improvement over the Wii U version, yet it can't seem to shirk a few frame drops here and there. It's shocking to see some appalling pop-in and decent texture work all running at 900p docked, considering the game can't maintain a stable 30fps at all times. I feel this speaks more to the hardware than it does the game, though I find it interesting that in handheld mode, Breath of the Wild runs at 720p and experiences almost no frame drops of any kind. It's worth mentioning that the frame drops when docked are far less severe than the Wii U version, but they occur in a few intense fights and definitely exist in the Forest Haven. Thankfully, areas like Zora's Domain and Kakariko Village run almost without a hitch, but the question I have is a simple one. Why is there no option to run Zelda at 720p when docked? This would surely stabilize the frame rate, and the graphical downgrade would not appear as intense as most other games because of the unique art style. Even if you disagree with me, if you prefer graphical fidelity over frame rate, wouldn't you like to have the option to prefer either one? Doesn't it feel just a little bit strange to have a preference forced down your throat? Options would please both fans who pride visuals and fans who pride performance. Nintendo stands to lose virtually nothing. If Nintendo is worried about overwhelming casual players with options, they could easily set the default graphical setting to 900p to ensure everyone at default is experiencing the game the way Nintendo thinks it will show off best. The option to change to 720p itself could easily be masked by a cleverly named toggle in the menu. The toggle for the HUD is between Normal and Pro. A similar toggle could have been added for something like Normal Mode or Performance Mode. Neo does something similar. It has three options, all explained fairly well. Action Mode for smooth performance, Movie Mode for better graphics, and a compromise between the two. Each mode is clearly explained in terms that can be understood by both casual and hardcore gamers. I just feel the need to point out that a game that prides itself so very much on player freedom lacks a very obvious option to choose between visuals or performance. 
Breath of the Wild adopts the design philosophy of Zelda 1 wholesale. Companion character? Gone. Dungeon order? Gone. Story focus? Gone. This is a no-holds-barred, non-linear Zelda game. As such, it has a fairly short opening. The Plateau is a genius introduction, at least on your first playthrough. It's a smaller scale version of Hyrule, and teaches you about what you'll be experiencing throughout the game. You can explore the plateau to your heart's content, either by following the path after you awaken, jumping off the cliff in front of you, or climbing up the nearby wall. No matter which you choose, you'll learn a valuable lesson. If you follow the path, you're rewarded with an NPC who will nudge you in the right direction. If you jump off the cliff, you'll learn the hard way that fall damage is more important this time around than it has ever been. And if you walk towards the wall, you'll be forced to learn about stamina management and the climbing system. Zelda won't tell you what to do until you travel too far in any direction. No matter which direction you decide to go, there are enemies to fight, so you learn about the combat system whether you want to or not. The best thing about the plateau is that blood moons will not spawn until you leave it. This means you can clear out the entirety of the plateau and none of the enemies will respawn, and since you can't leave the plateau, you'll eventually be left to follow the objective marker and complete the shrines. You aren't forced to do them right away, even if you'll have to eventually. I think this is a necessary compromise because the tools you obtain from each shrine are necessary so that you can truly visit any part of the world you desire without obstacle. The shrines you visit for upgrades can be done in any order, and each one provides a healthy learning environment for you to experiment with their basic functions. When you get your first rune, all the game tells you is how to activate a rune and how to switch between them. In the Magnesis Shrine, for instance, when you get the Magnesis rune, you're told how to activate it. It's up to you to make it to the end of the shrine by experimenting with it yourself. The tooltips at the bottom tell you what each button does at all times, much better than if it had tried to deliver that information in a text box. Even better, if you set the HUD to Pro Mode, the tooltips on the bottom disappear. If this was Skyward Sword, you can bet Fi would have told you the ins and outs of how Magnesis works right after the game itself tells you in a text box. Instead, you get the chance to try it out in a controlled environment. It teaches you to move metal objects out of the way, to push other objects, to make bridges, and to open metal doors. However, there are a few optional lessons to learn in this shrine, like using this metal block to kill a guardian, teaching you the combat applications of Magnesis, or pulling this chest toward you, showing that some chests at the very least can be controlled by Magnesis. You can use this information when you leave the shrine, as the pond next to you houses two metal chests you can drudge up. The other shrines serve the same purpose, but it's the location of each shrine that's important. Cryonis is found in the snowy area of the plateau, where you're introduced to temperature. If it's too cold or too hot, Link will take damage. Since you need this rune to leave the plateau, you need to figure out a way to survive the harsh temperatures, and there are a variety of ways to solve this puzzle. On my first playthrough, I noticed standing by fire caused the temperature to rise, so I took a nearby torch and walked across the dilapidated bridge over to the shrine with a few hearts to spare. That will always be my story, the solution to a puzzle that has a variety of solutions. I remember when I told my friends how I got through the snowy area, they were surprised. Many of my friends decided to tank the hits and use their supply of mushrooms to heal up along the way. On another playthrough, I knew about cooking, so I took the spicy peppers near the snowfield and plopped them into the cooking pot. It makes a food that grants cold resistance, which I use to brave the cold. I'm sure many people would hesitate to call something like this a puzzle, but I have no problem including it as such. The reason why I refuse to call something like feeding a fish to Jabu Jabu a puzzle is because there's only one solution, and that solution is more obtuse than it needs to be. This is a case where the game is obfuscating progression just because it can. Breath of the Wild attempts to teach you the bare minimum of each rune, so that you're ready to take on the four dungeons and 120 shrines scattered across Hyrule. After activating a Sheikah Tower, that portion of the map will fill in the topography, but nothing more. Unlike many other open world games, filling in the map doesn't mean a barrage of icons showing you everything you're now allowed to do. The Assassin's Creed series is particularly guilty of this content barf, with meaningless activities sprinkled about cities. And while it offers the player a wide range of activities, each of those activities are lacking in depth and are too clearly spelled out to remain interesting. Most of it strikes me as content for the sake of content. 
Random, meaningless collectibles, chests, shops, strongholds, citizens being harassed. You'll know where all of it is, it's just up to you to walk over to it and interact with it. I can't help but feel this process is busy work, meant to create a false sense of achievement by clearly showing how many of these activities exist. There's no sense of wonder here, you're just running through a checklist. Breath of the Wild won't use map icons unless you specifically place a marker or reach an area of interest. You have no idea what's in store for you until you begin exploring the world, and this is part of the reason the shrines are rewarding to find. Even the more obvious shrines are hard to see until you reach a vantage point and look out across the beautifully constructed Hyrule. You see a shrine and decide to head over to it, which changes the dynamic considerably. Instead of saying, let's do this thing next, you're left asking, what is that? Let's go find out. This feeling is exacerbated by the game giving you the freedom to explore Hyrule at your own pace. Upon finishing the plateau, you're given the paraglider, which allows you to glide off the plateau and begin exploring. King Rome tells you to head to Kakariko Village and points in the direction of it. Despite this, you can completely ignore him. There's a brilliant compromise struck here between players seeking guidance and players who want to pave their own path. The game is set up to allow the defeat of Ganon as soon as you jump off the plateau. Provided you're equipped and skilled enough to survive, you can beat the game in about an hour. This also means you can visit each dungeon in any order you want, or perhaps even decide to visit two or three dungeons, or none at all if you so desire. You can visit 120 shrines, or 20 shrines. You can find all 900 Korok seeds, or only 9 of them. The plateau equips you to deal with any shrine, dungeon, or a Korok seed puzzle. Though you can upgrade your runes to be more efficient, only the base runes are ever required. You have a near limitless set of options as to how you want to explore Hyrule, and I think that's important to brand your first playthrough with a unique, personal identity to share with other players, and enhances a second, third, fiftieth playthrough. It's very rare you'll be able to tackle what's in the world the same way twice. It fixes almost every problem I had with the Great Sea in The Wind Waker. Keyword, almost. Though it's wonderful to be given such an extreme sense of freedom, the content of Hyrule matters just as much, if not more, than the freedom to explore it. As I mentioned, there are 4 dungeons, 120 shrines, 900 Korok seeds, 76 side quests, 13 memories, 4 great fairies, a wide variety of shields, bows, arrows, clothing, weapons, materials, and, of course, Hyrule Castle. Because there's so much content in Hyrule, it means you're always stumbling across something new. Be that an enemy encampment hiding a special weapon, a shrine or Korok seed puzzle, a citizen being attacked by monsters, a Sheikah tower, any number of surprise side quests. Shrines are probably the most fulfilling to find, and 42 of them have special shrine quests associated with them. There are three types of shrine, the ones you find randomly placed in the world with a set of puzzles inside, the ones that have puzzles outside of the shrine in order to access the shrine itself, and the test of strength trials where you fight a mini guardian. The puzzles inside the shrines are fairly hit or miss unfortunately because they can't introduce concepts to be used in later shrines since none of the shrines are required. This forces each shrine to handle a different type of puzzle, or use the same type of puzzle without evolving the concept. Take a shrine like The Wind Guides You, in which you take advantage of wind currents using your paraglider. As long as you tap the jump button again inside the wind current, it will push you forward without forcing a descent. The wind currents are a needlessly complex way to get Link moving through a linear path, as opposed to simply having him walk there. The only meaningful challenge the shrine asks of you is to perform a simple paraglide over to a chest, which is so incredibly disconnected from the concept of wind currents. I wouldn't even say the shrine toys with the concept of wind currents, because they copy-paste the same activity four times. The first wind current is a safe environment to test the mechanic. The second wind current has a pit to cross with a relatively low landing zone. 
and the last wind current has the same gap, but the landing zone is a bit less lenient. The problem with this escalation is that the increase in complexity is so minuscule that there's no challenge to overcome. It's effectively a waste of your time, because it doesn't set up for anything outside of the shrine, nor does it challenge you inside it. Synced Swing is a more complex shrine, but it shares a similar problem. It revolves around the use of magnesis. First you use it to get a platform moving back and forth, then you use it to move spike balls out of the way, then you use it to bring platforms toward you, and then you use it to move a torch to hopefully get it to land on some foliage. This shrine does a much better job at challenge escalation than the previous shrine. You learn through both the platforms swinging and the spike balls swinging that you can cause a metal object to swing back and forth. There's also a section in the middle of the swinging platforms and spike balls which asks you to cut two pieces of rope to lower a bridge. The final puzzle of the shrine involves moving a torch attached to a rope and cutting that rope as it swings so that the torch will land on foliage. This is a timing-based puzzle that takes advantage of what you previously learned about magnesis and what you also learned about cutting rope. The problem is the unnecessary fat that doesn't relate to the difficulty escalation. Firstly, wouldn't it make more sense to keep only the spike ball segments instead of the moving platforms? They're both easy activities, which are fine for teaching you a mechanic to test you later in the shrine, but they both teach you the exact same idea. They're too simple on their own to prove a challenge. Even the extra chest in this shrine is hidden behind a much bigger spike ball, but you can get to that chest by doing the same thing you did with the other spike balls. The size of that spike ball doesn't affect the way in which you solve the puzzle. It's weird to me, because the bonus chests in shrines are supposed to be well hidden or more challenging to collect. The other bonus chest seems to take up more of your time, rather than present a worthwhile challenge. The puzzle requires you to pull four blocks with magnesis to make a staircase, but under the platform you need to reach is a bonus chest. You can either paraglide under the platform, or make a reverse staircase. Pulling the blocks is just block pushing in disguise. You've figured out how you're to arrange the staircase before the puzzle has even begun. It's all a matter of tediously pulling the blocks to make the staircase. This blinding simplicity is what kills many of the shrines for me, and the ease at which you complete them is further compounded by the final puzzle of this shrine. I mentioned before how it tests you based on two puzzle concepts you learned with magnesis. However, if you have a fire arrow or fire weapon, you can bypass the timing puzzle completely. While it may sound great to have multiple solutions to a puzzle, those solutions need to be balanced so that no matter how you solve the puzzle, it ends up being satisfying. Using magnesis and stasis to maneuver the lantern onto the foliage to burn the way open is satisfying, but shooting an arrow or throwing a fire sword at the ground isn't as satisfying. I also find that the length of the shrines aren't conducive to the time required to properly evolve any particular mechanic. Drifting is a great example. It only has three puzzles. First to walk across a plank of wood that's drifting across the water, then to walk across a sequence of three planks drifting across the water one after the other, then to throw a bomb into the water so it drifts over to the weak wall across from you, and you detonate the bomb. What is the purpose of this puzzle? Is it challenging? I'd hesitate to call it even remotely intimidating unless you decide to look for bonus chests. The hidden chests are almost used as crutches to hide the blatant simplicity of the main shrine puzzles. I'm not saying it doesn't work, the weapons, materials, and rupees you receive from them are welcome. In this shrine, they're hidden underwater, so they're clearly out of the way and rewarding to collect, and saves the shrine from feeling like a formality. When it comes to an effective use of a central shrine mechanic, look no further than Blue Flame, a shrine revolving around the transfer of a blue flame. The dungeon provides you with a torch to light and carry with you through the shrine. You first need to line up a staircase with two metal boxes using magnesis, and then you need to get your lit torch across a pathway with water spouts. The last water spout is unavoidable unless you crouch under it. Unless of course you use a bow to light an arrow, and then shoot it where you need the flame to go. This might be more viable for the next transfer, because you have to get the flame to a faraway sconce. As far as I know, the only way to get the flame across such a long distance is to shoot an arrow, unless you can somehow throw the lit torch, which you only get one shot at or you lose it. This opens the path up a staircase to a button. You can find a way around a spike ball rolling at you by avoiding it, or using stasis to keep it in place and walk around it. Then you can take the blue flame into the next area with three sconces. 
two of the sconces will activate both water spouts when one of them is lit, so you need to find a way to activate them both simultaneously, which you can accomplish using an arrow or a spin attack with a lit torch. The next challenge is to light two sconces close to simultaneously, since the platforms are moving in and out of the water spouts on either side. The easiest way to complete this is to shoot one arrow to hit both of the sconces at the same time, which activates the wind currents to carry you across to the next challenge, where you need to move a platform past a water spout before lighting the sconce. You can also optionally use the blue flame to light some foliage and take care of some mini guardians if you don't want to fight them, which is a great optional solution to a combat encounter. The final challenge requires a spin attack with a lit torch, because there are six sconces with water spouts on each one of them that all activate when one of the sconces is lit. This is a very solid shrine, and many of the puzzles have multiple solutions. You can do most of it with a bow, or most of it with a torch, but it requires the use of both the torch and the arrow to progress. While this makes for a complex, thought-provoking shrine that I enjoyed, I almost didn't enjoy it because when I first visited the shrine, I was low on arrows. I figured the shrine would probably let me progress with a torch, since it provided me with a torch, as opposed to providing me with arrows. So when I got to the moving platforms, I decided to throw my torch at one of the platforms because I figured that I could use my torch the entire way through. Unfortunately, in the act of throwing the torch, it fell off the platform and into the lava below, never to be seen again. I didn't have arrows, and I didn't have a torch. I also didn't have any wooden weapons, so that route was quickly shot down. I was forced to leave the shrine to restock my arrow supply, which was incredibly demoralizing. I got all the way to the end with my fresh stock of arrows, only to realize I needed a wooden weapon to light on fire, which I didn't have either. I had to leave a second time to go get myself a branch, then come back to the shrine and do the lit spin attack to finish it. Though I think the design of the shrine is great, with a variety of unique puzzles to transfer the blue flame, it may force you to leave if you're underprepared, which is upsetting. The shrine should have accounted for this and given you a torch and a set of arrows if you lose the torch or run out of arrows. I'm particularly fond of shrines like Fateful Stars, which is so ambiguous it's satisfying to figure out. A stone tablet tells you to look at the constellations for answers. There are constellations on the walls to the side and in front of you. Additionally, there are ball sockets to the right and left, each with three columns and five rows. The five rows have numbered torches to designate a number, and the three columns have constellations to designate a particular pattern. The collection of constellations in front of you is initially fairly confusing, because there are actually duplicate constellations, but since they're in a different orientation, they're hard to spot. At first, I didn't notice the panel of constellations in front of me, so I left the shrine and looked to the stars. Those of you that have actually completed this shrine are probably laughing at me, but it's true this was my first instinct. Eventually, I went back in and found the panel of constellations, so I then tried to count the amount of dots on each constellation, but it bore no fruit. Turns out you're supposed to count the number of repeat constellations and put the ball in the correct number for each column. The bonus chest has a separate panel you have to use to rearrange the balls and to open the way up to a bonus chest. This is one of my favorite shrines, because it has an individual puzzle that's so ambiguous, it promotes thorough exploration of the shrine to figure out how each segment correlates to one another. Though I generally think the puzzles inside of the shrines are lackluster, I don't think it ultimately ends up negatively impacting the exploration as much as you would expect. It is disappointing to stumble across such a simple challenge when you find a shrine, but the act of finding that shrine and the reward waiting for you at the end usually makes up for it. Maybe this doesn't apply as much to the shrines out in the open, but the shrines hidden behind shrine quests are much more fulfilling to find. Cass might sing you a song, and the lyrics hint toward what you have to do to open the shrine. You might have to shoot one arrow through two rock holes at the same time. The trick here is to find out which duo of rocks allows you to shoot one arrow that can pass through two holes. You might need to get naked during a blood moon, which doesn't sound super complex, but the way the lyrics are worded doesn't immediately spell that out. He sings the following, When the moon bleeds and the fiends are reborn, the Nux will invite you as they have sworn. But first you must stand on the pedestal bare, with nothing between you and the night air. This can mean a number of things. Do you need nothing to be in between you and the blood moon? 
It doesn't necessarily say you need to get naked, but experimenting with that and figuring out how to activate the shrine is rewarding. Plus, you can always come back if you can't immediately figure it out. He has another song that goes something like this. A beast that wears a crown of bone, prancing through the lush green, mount the beast upon its throne, for only then the shrine is seen. At first, I had no idea what this meant. I thought maybe I had to go fight a skeleton monster or something. My friend was sitting next to me at the time, and he suggested, why don't you just ride a deer onto the pedestal? The antlers look like a crown of bone. And my reaction went something like this. You can ride a deer? That's the impressive thing about Breath of the Wild. You never stop learning about the interplay between different mechanics. Just when I thought I knew everything, something new would throw me for a loop. I'd try to throw a bomb at a group of enemies, only for them to kick it back at me. I'd be fighting a moblin, only for them to pick up a fellow bokoblin and throw him at me. I'll never forget the first encounter I had with lightning. I had no idea what was happening, and I figured out far too late that the sparks on Link were signaling a lightning bolt. It took me a while to learn what had caused it. I had initially thought it was just bad luck. Then I noticed the metal weapons in my inventory were sparking, which is when it hit me that wearing metal equipment would draw lightning. I was similarly awestruck by the lightning serpent Feroche. I was exploring the southeast portion of Hyrule when I looked to my left and saw a giant golden serpent. My mind was racing, trying to figure out what this th thing was. Would I have to fight it? I tried landing on it, and that plan failed miserably, so I shot a few arrows at it, which dislodged one of its scales. I watched it fly into the air, wondering if maybe I could ride it up there to a secret area. Even better, once I got the scale, I remembered what the Spring of Courage said moments earlier, to offer Feroche's scale from the Golden Serpent. It got me thinking. If this is the Spring of Courage, it stands to reason there'd be a Spring of Wisdom and Power, per the balance of the Triforce. That got me thinking even further. Are there two more serpents flying around Hyrule? Sure enough, hours later I found Dinrol, the Fire Serpent, flying around the west portion of Hyrule. This sense of discovery is what threads the experience together. Before release, I was very worried that the size of the world would negatively impact the game's progression. In games like Metal Gear Solid V, it eventually became a chore to travel from mission to mission because most of that consists of walking. Breath of the Wild has a huge world and a lot of travel time, but makes effective use of that increased travel time by always giving you a goal to work toward. You see a shrine off in the distance, you're probably going to travel to that shrine. Along the way, you'll find several enemy encampments with treasure to loot, in addition to a bunch of Korok seed puzzles, which are satisfying to complete in a vacuum. You might have to move a rock to complete a pattern, or paraglide over to a ring in the distance, or shoot some moving targets with your bow. You can give the Korok seeds you get from it to Hestu so that he can increase your inventory, meaning you can hold more shields, bows, and weapons all at once. It might take you upwards of a half hour to reach that shrine you saw based on how willing you are to deviate from that path and explore your laundry list of available options. Travel is working towards something meaningful. In Metal Gear Solid V, the question is always, where do I go next? There's no thought as to how you're going to get there, because you have a waypoint guiding you every step of the way. It causes you to watch the dot on your minimap move instead of the playable character. In Breath of the Wild, you're always asking, how do I get there? Do you have to scale a mountain, swim up a waterfall, shield surf down a snowbank, glide off of a tower? You almost never stare at the minimap, and I turn off the HUD for that reason. I don't need a weather forecast or a temperature meter, I just need a focused sightline into the beautifully constructed Hyrule. Monolith Soft was brought on for the world design, and they did a phenomenal job. I've always been a fan of their environment design, especially in a game like Xenoblade Chronicles, which takes place on two giant titans, giving them a ton of creative license, as well as a huge scope. Breath of the Wild's Hyrule is the most fully realized Hyrule in the franchise. It takes what I loved about Twilight Princess's authentic world building and adds to it with a larger scope. Sometimes I just stop moving and take in the world, looking around at various landmarks telling myself, wow, I wonder what's hidden over there. It gives me the same magical feeling as when I was a kid, exploring the Great Sea. When I was younger, I obviously wasn't into game design analysis, so I didn't ask myself a lot of questions. 
I just sailed around to figure out what was in the world, and I couldn't have been happier. Breath of the Wild manages to recapture that feeling in a way no other Zelda game has managed in a very long time. I mean, I stumbled across the Master Sword on a whim. I was just exploring the northern portion of Hyrule and found the Lost Woods. It was a bitch of a time to find my way through it, but once I got through the puzzle, I found the Master Sword just lying there, waiting for me to take it. But I couldn't take it then, because I needed a specific amount of permanent hearts. I would keep coming back here, shrine after shrine after shrine, to see if I could draw the Master Sword from its pedestal, until finally at 13 hearts, I managed it, and I was so excited. It doesn't break, only loses energy and needs to recharge every once in a while. It does 30 base damage and 60 to guardians, which completely destroys them. It's a super satisfying reward. Maybe even worth forsaking some stamina upgrades to receive. Side note, you can increase your stamina, which is an idea I had in Skyward Sword, and I'm super glad they followed through with it. I honestly would have preferred you start Breath of the Wild with two stamina wheels and have the max be four stamina wheels, but hey, one stamina wheel isn't horrible and you can climb most objects with that amount. I just think for the sake of being able to sprint around everywhere for a long period of time, two stamina wheels would have been a better default than one. I really love the Master Sword because it's a permanent weapon that completely destroys the once terrifying guardians. And if you attempt to throw it at full health, it shoots out a beam like in the classic games. You can similarly find the Hylian shield hidden away in Hyrule Castle. It's a nearly unbreakable shield, and it's so much more satisfying to find because it's hidden away instead of lying in a shop somewhere. There are also a few very unique shrine quests, like one in the northwest portion of Hyrule. You're told by a Rito child that her grandfather saw a bird when he climbed a tree off in the distance. When you climb this tree, if you look out in a specific direction, the different hilltops form the shape of a bird you can glide toward. This is a neat perspective trick. Similarly, there are a few puzzles involving getting specific balls into the correct sockets. There's an area in the Midwest portion of Hyrule where it's constantly raining, and you need to get four colored balls into the right holes. The easiest way to do this is by using stasis to hit the balls onto the platform. It's not as easy as it looks, especially because rain makes it harder to climb obstacles, so Rivali's Gale is a very helpful tool here. I actually waited until I had Rivali's Gale until I came back to complete this shrine quest. The environmental shrine quests are so satisfying to seek out and solve, and if they didn't exist, I'd think much less of the shrine system in general. This, of course, doesn't mean everything you end up finding is going to be worth the travel you put into it. As I said, I don't necessarily mind the simple puzzles as much, but there's that third type of shrine I mentioned much earlier in the video that irritates me to no end. The Test of Strength Trials. If I had to guess, there are probably close to 20 of these damn things, and they're all close to identical. You fight a mini guardian who holds a different set of weapons each time with the exact same moveset. Sometimes you won't have stone pillars, and instead you'll have water for Cryonis pillars, or metal pillars you can use Magnesis to drudge up. He can do a spin charge, which you can stop by having him run into a pillar, he can spin his laser around in a circle, which forces you to use your paraglider, and then he has a desperation attack where he charges up a huge laser to shoot at you. My first encounter with one of these was extremely unpleasant. I was low on weapons, and in the middle of the fight, all of them broke, and I was out of arrows. This highlights a major issue with the durability system, a system which on its own is a decent idea. Since there are so many different weapons that you're allowed to find at any point, implementing a durability system would make it so that you won't have an infinite supply of 70 strength weapons to flaunt around in easier areas like Zora's Domain. I understand why the system needs to exist, but I have to say it's a bit too harsh. Weapons of all types break far too quickly, lower level weapons breaking with only about 20 swings, and higher level weapons breaking in about 40 to 50 swings depending. You also don't have any way of tracking how close your weapon is to breaking, though it definitely forces you to use a variety of weapons and helps to keep you from getting too overpowered, it can put you in a situation like this one in the test of strength trial, 
where without a base weapon, you end up useless, resorting to bombs. Bombs, however, are not a good stand-in for a default unbreakable weapon. They do as little damage as possible, meaning you'll have to throw a metric fuckton to chip away the enemy health bar to any meaningful percentage. This is where I was at in the fight, running around the Mini Guardian as he charged his laser, dropping bombs whenever I could, and I did this for almost 10 minutes. It was mind-numbing. It's hard to think of a perfect solution to this durability issue because it both creates and fixes potential problems. The real issue for me, though, is that there are several points in the game where you could be defenseless, and bombs are incredibly impractical combat tools. It would be better to give Link a weak, unbreakable sword, shield, and bow that upgrade over time, but can never reach the same heights as some of the stronger weaponry. Let's say they can only reach 40 or 50 strength after an extensive amount of work. This would fix the problem of running out of weapons, while incentivizing the use of stronger, more varied weaponry. Of course, it's hard to reach that same level of diversity when the game isn't forcing you to use it, but the power imbalance should be enough of an incentive. With this system in place, weapon durability could stand to be a bit more lenient. After 60 or so swings, lower level weapons should break, and after maybe 100 or so swings, higher level weapons should break. As a result of this, just spawn less weapons for the player to use. This way the player can still stockpile weapons, but at a slower rate. If we could also see a durability meter for our weapons, it would be a near-perfect system. Even then, an idea is just an idea. I don't know how well it would work unless I design it and have it playtested. I can only speak to my own frustrations of finding a really cool weapon and having it break seconds later. It isn't a perfect system, though I'm glad it exists in some form or another, or I wouldn't have been as willing to experiment. Instead of just using one sword, Link can use a near limitless arsenal of weaponry. Everything from swords, to halberds, to spears, to longswords, to greatswords, to battle axes, to magic rods, to bows with specialty arrows ranging from fire, ice, shock, bomb, and ancient arrows to damaged guardians. The combat system is similar to Twilight Princess, but adopts the parry system used in Skyward Sword. If you shield bash with the correct timing, you can stagger your opponent. This time, however, the window is much less lenient, which means timing is a bigger priority. Additionally, since the durability system is much harsher, shields have a chance to break if you use them too recklessly, so that concern exists where it didn't in Skyward Sword. Not only that, but you have a dodge button, and if you dodge at just the right time, you can follow up with a flurry of attacks in slow motion. Each weapon attacks in a different way, similar to action-focused fighters like Devil May Cry and Bayonetta, but not nearly as complex. Short swords let you do a standard spin attack, great swords let Link spin around in a circle, allowing movement during an elongated spin attack, albeit much slower than a normal spin attack. Spears let you attack from a distance, and the charge attack lets you rapidly stab at your opponent from afar. You also have access to a plummet attack while you're in the air, as well as access to your bow to freeze, shock, or burn your opponent. You can even throw weapons to cause critical damage, at the cost of the weapon likely breaking. Or you can paraglide over an enemy and drop a bomb on them. Or you can stasis an enemy to stop them in their tracks. Or you can hit an explosive barrel to clear out a skull cave. Or you can hit an enemy in the head with an arrow for critical damage. Or you can pick up a metal object with magnesis and hit them with it repeatedly. Or you can throw a metal boomerang during a thunderstorm and have the lightning hit the boomerang as it passes over a group of enemies. Yeah, there are a lot of options available to you. Gone are the days of spamming the spin attack. You have so much freedom to approach a battle in any which way you'd prefer. Maybe if you're fighting a tough enemy, you'll try to stay back and fire arrows, or you might be better at dodging so you'll stick close to the enemy. This is unprecedented in Zelda. Not even Twilight Princess came this close. Skyward Sword had an engaging combat system, but that was mostly because the motion controls were more complex than a button press, and turning combat into a series of mini-puzzles was beneficial to that goal. Breath of the Wild takes traditional Zelda combat and improves it. Enemy AI is surprisingly intelligent. Bokoblins attack predictably based on which weapons they're using, similar to how Link uses his weapons. Moblins attack with much bigger weapons, so there are wider swings with more devastating blows. Lizalfos are very agile, jumping around at a lightning-quick pace. Often if you attempt to shoot them with an arrow, they'll start pacing back and forth to avoid it. Lynels pack the punch of a moblin, 
the health bar of a boss, and the agility of a Lazalfos, all with an increased set of moves to back that up. They are terrifying to say the least. They can shoot shock arrows at you, they have a fire AoE attack, they can charge straight at you. It's really hard to get a grip on what a Lionel is going to do next. Then there are the Guardians, which are equally terrifying. My first encounter with a Guardian didn't go well. They can spot you from what seems like a mile away as they charge up their laser and crawl to you with their spider legs, and this very off-putting music starts to play. Early game, these things are a fucking nightmare, because if they hit you with their lasers even once, they'll easily take away your middling three hearts. Coming back late game to challenge them is no small feat. I eventually learned you could parry their lasers back at them, but fucking up the timing is near fatal. You can try hitting them in the eye with an arrow to stun them periodically, but their movements become increasingly harder to track, and if you take too long to hit them, you'll be hit with a laser, which will probably insta-kill you. The difficulty is just another reason this game is such a breath of fresh air. It frequently uses multiple enemies, but rarely do I feel it's implemented poorly. You're equipped with a variety of AoE attacks to deal with multiple enemies effectively, especially after conquering the divine beast Van Naboris. Though the combat is always engaging, thanks to a variety of options, the difficulty balancing is much less polished. I don't much mind wandering into an area where everyone kicks your ass, in fact I kinda like that. Exploring Hyrule Castle in the early game is terrifying because everything can one-shot you, but that's why it's so satisfying to explore early on. If the game was constantly scaled to your level, it would ruin the suspense. I have more of a problem with areas that don't scale up to you in difficulty. For example, I did Zora's Domain last, and because I had explored the world pretty thoroughly at that point, I had a large quantity of powerful weapons and armor, not to mention I had a shit ton of hearts from all the shrines that I had completed. To see each of the enemies with such a small amount of HP, doing almost no damage to me, was fairly disheartening. There's a Lionel you need to sneak around to grab shock arrows for the fight against the divine beast Varuta. He's clearly designed to be a tough challenge early game so you won't easily take him on, even though the option is always available for you to fight him if you're feeling ballsy. Having come back with a huge arsenal, I beat the Lionel in no time flat because he's one of the easiest Lionel types in the game. It sucks the tension right out of an encounter, and it's a bit hard to stay engaged when I stumble across an easier area. The game attempts to counteract this by placing spotted enemies that are clearly more powerful, and they don't start appearing until you meet some unknown requirement, so that's a step in the right direction. But there comes a point where you can outclass most enemies by upgrading your equipment at the Great Fairy. I'm glad the material and upgrade system is back in some fashion, because it incentivizes even more exploration to look for materials, bugs, food. The cooking system serves that same goal, to give you food to restore hearts, stamina, give you temporary heart and stamina upgrades, increase your stealthiness, give you a defense or offense boost. There are so many things you can conjure up in a cooking pot. You also need to experiment yourself, since you aren't given a cookbook or anything to follow. The Great Fairy can use your materials to upgrade your armor to a ludicrous degree, and if you pair that with a defense boost potion, you'll likely never find another difficult encounter again. They slightly balance this by only allowing specific buffs to be applied one at a time. You can't have both a defense boost and an offense boost active at the same time, for example. You're forced to choose, which does help balance the system a bit. What doesn't help is the ability to eat food in the middle of combat at any point with no consequence. If you're running low on hearts, you can pause the game, whip out a food you have cooked up, and instantly recover hearts. It baffles me there's no consequence in place to stop this from happening, because it encourages reckless play more than ever. There's not even a limit as to how many fairies you can hold at any point, unlike previous Zelda games. If you wanted, you can stockpile a metric fuckton of fairies to ensure that you never see a game over screen. This incentivizes you to brute force everything, because even if you take damage, you'll either get revived or you have enough food to recover hearts in the middle of combat. As you would imagine, this negatively affects the difficulty balance overall. Yeah, you can opt out of doing it pretty easily, hell, I did that, but again, I'd like to discuss the concept of the optimal strategy. If there's something you can do to make the game easier with no cost to the player, you bet the player is going to utilize that opportunity. There are simply too many options to make the game easier. I'm curious to see how hard mode will affect this difficulty balancing later down the line. 
I'm already a bit miffed at the amiibo support in this game because it's in almost the exact same position as Twilight Princess HD. There are several cosmetic rewards, like the Big Goron Sword or the Hero of Time Tunic or a bunch of other visual references to past Zelda games you can get through amiibo. That much is harmless, and even if you get a powerful weapon, you can only use them once a day and the weapons break quickly anyway, so it doesn't feel like you're cheating the game. Yet, there are two amiibo that give you some pretty major rewards. Wolf Link and Epona. If you scan the Smash Brothers Link amiibo, you get Epona, who is the best possible horse you can obtain. It's cool that Epona is in the game in some fashion, but this really should have been a secret somewhere. It doesn't necessarily negatively impact the game because you can get Epona level horses in the wild, but not being able to get Epona on your own is incredibly disheartening. The more disheartening inclusion is that of Wolf Link, which you can use as a companion in fights. In the base game, you aren't even allowed to tame regular animals to have them fight for you. This is a mechanic you can only experience if you have Wolf Link, which is fine for people that own the amiibo now, but it's going to have a negative impact on the game years down the line when Wolf Link becomes rare or unobtainable. He's a cool reward, but this is a system that should have been in place already so that people don't feel cheated out of a mechanic because they didn't buy one of Nintendo's overpriced pieces of plastic. Whether or not hard mode can fix the difficulty balancing issues, I don't know. However, I do enjoy the visual progression of Link from a naked boy into a fully equipped warrior. There are so many different armor sets you can equip for different situations, so many weapons, shields, and bows for Link to carry on his back, and he never looks the same because of that. It's a far cry from the traditional green tunic, and I love it. Additionally, you look like a goddamn badass later in the game with a cool armor set and a shit ton of cool looking elemental weapons. Even using the Master Sword and Hylian Shield look as cool as ever because you don't constantly have to wear them. It probably has the best character progression of any Zelda game because of that visual variety, as well as how much it increases your offensive capabilities. Having such a wide array of options during combat, from your giant flame sword, to your electric arrows, to your ice spear, there are so many options it's ludicrous. This is such a big improvement on the idea of dungeon items, which basically no longer exist. Instead, you have a variety of realistic logic puzzles in almost every scenario. You can use Cryonis to get across water where you'd otherwise drown from a lack of stamina. You can freeze an enemy in place and push them off a cliff. You can shoot an electric arrow at the water to cause a giant shockwave, hitting every enemy in the radius. Electricity and ice both stun the enemy, fire can burn the enemy or burn the ground for an updraft you can use to fly into the air on your paraglider and shoot an enemy in midair or plummet into the ground. Fire can also keep you warm in the cold or burn thorns and foliage. There's so much you can do with fire, and so many ways to produce fire. You can stun an enemy with it, or hit an object to send it flying away, or stop a boulder barreling toward you. Even Cryonis, which probably has a much less obvious use case, can be used to get Link across water or drudge up chests floating above the water, and the game even uses it in a few boss fights to stop ice blocks from hitting you. The bosses suffer the most from the difficulty issues, much more than the regular fights. Boss fights in Hyrule Field vary in difficulty. Those bosses suffer the most from the difficulty issues, unfortunately, much more than regular fights. Stone Talus are almost never a challenge. You can just climb up their back and hit their ore vein enough to kill them. Hinox are a bit more difficult because you need to hit them in the eye to stagger them. And there are several variations of the Hinox. Sometimes they protect their legs, forcing you to hit them in the eye, and after a few hits, the Hinox will cover their eye with their hand to prevent you from stunlocking them. They pack a pretty fierce punch, but once you've beaten the fifth Hinox, it becomes pretty easy to predict their attacks and dodge accordingly. Molduga is a much larger threat, and it's a lot harder to fight. You have to lure it out of the sand so you can shoot it with an arrow or throw a bomb, which will attract him to the vibration, and you can detonate the bomb after Molduga eats it. This is a near impossible task on your own, so you'll need a sand seal to outrun Molduga before it emerges out from under you and damages you. If you can time your arrows to hit the fast moving Molduga, eventually you'll stun it so you can hit it with your normal weapons, if you don't want to use your bombs. The Molduga fight reminds me of Puppet Ganon from The Wind Waker because you have to time your arrow shots in much the same way, just added to the fast movement of the sand seal. Unfortunately, there are far more fights against the Stone Talus and Hinox, which get stale after repeated fights. I would have loved to see even more fights against Molduga, but they only exist in the desert. The traditional boss fights are located in each of the four, technically five, dungeons. 
Each boss is a variation on Calamity Ganon, and none of them are particularly complex, save for a few. Let's take Windblight Ganon for the sake of example. He attacks with tornadoes and his laser cannon. You have to use the gusts of wind to paraglide around, trying to hit him in the air with your bow. The problem is that his attacks are so easy to avoid. He has such a long windup for his tornado attack, and the tornado moves so slowly you'll likely be out of the way in no time flat. His laser cannon is a bit more threatening, but because of the gusts of wind, the lasers will have a much harder time hitting you. They don't home in on you once shot, so if you're moving quickly enough you can easily avoid them. Plus, if you're versed in the parry system, you can shoot the laser back at Windblight Ganon for even more damage. Additionally, if you shoot his eye with a few arrows, you can stun him, trivializing the fight even further. It's simply far too easy, and I really feel that's true for both Fire Blight and Water Blight Ganon. Each one is a bit more unique, using Bombs and Cryonis respectively, but they're far too easy for their own good. Fire Blight Ganon just throws his huge sword around, occasionally spitting embers at you. Though those embers fly at such a slow pace, they're barely a threat. But when he's that easily stunned because of it, it becomes more of a novelty than a challenge that cheapens over the course of the battle. Water Blight Ganon has a similar problem. As long as you can keep hitting him with arrows and downing him, he'll never get the chance to attack you with his giant, slow-moving spear. Sometimes you'll have to use Cryonis to break his ice blocks, but that's about it. His second phase turns the arena into water, making use of Cryonis to build platforms, but there's really nothing stopping you from swimming instead. It feels like the same fight. Just because the arena changes midway doesn't make the fight dynamic. Thunder Blight Ganon is one of the only difficult boss battles, and it's why I love him. He's much quicker and attacks you directly most of the time. He'll warp up to you and swing his sword, prompting you to dodge or parry him for the stun. He deals a lot of damage and gets more of a chance to damage you because of his speed, especially in his second phase when his sword is electrified and can stun you when hit. I got several game overs in this fight, and it makes cool use of metal conducting electricity. You have to pull a peg out from under the ground and up to him so you can use the electricity against him and stun him. What I like so much about the fight is that you have to think on your feet and use caution, because he's perfectly capable of completely wrecking your shit if you screw up. This is also why I like Calamity Ganon's first phase. He combines every aspect of the Ganon boss fights into one terrifying beast. He has the giant flame sword, several weapons near his head, the ability to crawl around like a guardian, to fly around the room, even to shoot lasers. This fight is all about parrying or dodging at the correct times, and can quickly turn sour if you aren't well versed in the combat. His attacks are extremely devastating, so avoiding them is practically required. It forces you to time your parries and dodges, and shoot Calamity Ganon down from his flight using arrows. You're even forced to use the parry on the laser beams in the Desperation phase, where he flames up his body like Fire Blight Ganon. It's a fantastic culmination of the brilliant combat system, testing you on everything you've learned over the course of the game. Beast Ganon, though, well, that's another story. Beast Ganon is quite possibly the worst 3D Zelda final boss ever created. I mean that wholeheartedly. Zelda gives you a bow that shoots light arrows, and you ride your horse around Ganon shooting his weak spots. It makes good use of your bow, especially when you jump off your horse and use slow motion to hit them all individually. But once you realize that's the extent of the fight, well, it's just such a disappointing finale. Beast Ganon cannot hit you because his frontward attack is so slow and his turning radius is laughable. If you just ride around his sides and back, he'll never get a chance to hit you. I fought this boss three times, and not once have I ever come close to being hit by him. The real problem with this fight is that it only tests one of Link's abilities as opposed to his several other abilities that went unchecked in the previous phase. Using your bow to hit shiny targets is a surface level application. It should have made use of his climbing to maybe climb up Beast Ganon Shadow of the Colossus style and give Ganon more attacks to use when you're in his blind side. Think of the boss fight with the blue serpent Nadra. You have to clear the malice from its body by using the paraglider to catch its updrafts and then use a slow motion bow to hit the eyes on several parts of its body. The problem is that because Nadra moves so fast and, you know, Nadra's flying around in the air, it's much harder to paraglide into a correct position to hit an eye especially because that eye could be on any angle of the serpent. This isn't a masterclass in difficulty or anything, but it tests both your paragliding and bow using skills. It would have been even cooler if you can mount Nadra, but that's neither here nor there. As it stands, Nadra is a better final boss than Beast Ganon, which is very, very disappointing. 
It just baffles me because the first phase was pretty decent, but this phase just shits all over it. It doesn't feel as epic as they probably hoped it would, even with the amazing remix of the main theme playing in the background. The problem is that no matter how epic the scenery, or the music, or the design of Calamity Ganon, the fight is so boring that it all crumbles. It's so simple that any meaningful sense of challenge or accomplishment is immediately sucked out of the fight. I don't want to have to say this, but usually the quality of the dungeons is linked to the quality of the boss fights. I really don't like Wind Blight Ganon, and I also happen to dislike Divine Beast Va Mado because it's one of the easiest dungeons I've ever played. I love the idea of the Divine Beasts, and initially I was pumped to enter one. The moment I realized that dungeons were the Divine Beasts of Legend used to fight Ganondorf, I was instantly intrigued. That intrigue quickly wears away when each of the four dungeons begin to get repetitive. Go to an area, meet a few special people of that race that are descendants of the Ancestor or some shit, do some stuff for them, and then attempt to mount the Divine Beast, which is always a different variation of hit him in the legs with the exception of Varudanya. In Va Mado, you fight the Divine Beast exterior by paragliding around the Divine Beast and using the slow motion bow firing to hit all four of his weak spots with bomb arrows. The problem here is that Va Mado doesn't really put up a fight. It just has lasers it can fire, which as I mentioned before, are so easily dodgeable in midair, it's almost a joke. It's a cool concept the first time you do it though. I was impressed when I played it in the Wii U version and traveled to Zoro's domain first. Fighting Varuta was so cool, with the epic music in the background, riding on Sidon's back, deflecting the ice blocks being thrown at me, swimming up waterfalls to shoot the four weak spots on Ruta. Going to Va Naboris, the same thing happens on a sand seal. Varudanya is the only unique one in this regard, because you have to sneak past the flying guardians and shoot Unobo out of a cannon to damage the divine beast. It's fun to sneak your way past the Flying Guardians and get Unobo through it all, and it's a nice pattern break from the other three Divine Beasts. In terms of actual dungeon quality though, I have to say, I'm disappointed. Though I initially found the concept of exploring the inner workings of a giant beast to be fairly novel, that novelty wears off pretty fast. They might all be shaped differently, with a different central mechanic, but the theming is a red version of the shrine layouts. This theme is already pretty old in the shrines themselves, so I wasn't impressed to see it in the dungeons. I was impressed by my first dungeon, Varuta, because I thought the central mechanic was unique. In each dungeon, you move a segment of the dungeon itself on the map screen. In this case, you move Varuta's trunk to douse water on certain segments of the dungeon to move water wheels or douse fire, but I noticed it lacked a lot of depth. There were a few individual puzzles to solve using the trunk of the elephant, but none of the puzzles were ever that difficult to solve until I figured out I could move the trunk. Most of the difficulty I had with this dungeon is because I didn't know at first I could even move the trunk, so I had no idea how to move the water wheel. Once I solved that, each puzzle was a piece of cake, and it goes by in about 15 minutes if you know what you're doing, which is a far cry from traditional dungeon design. But I had three more dungeons waiting for me, so I persisted. I then moved to Va Mado, which as I already alluded to, didn't impress me all that much. I thought turning the beast to different angles was cool at first, but the puzzles are just too simple. For instance, you move a ball around by tilting the divine beast, and all it requires is you opening the map, changing a few options, and waiting for it all to play out. I love the option to complete any section of the dungeon in any order, but since none of them are complex, it makes for an incredibly boring dungeon. There's a puzzle where you have to get a ball to hit a switch hard enough by falling into it at a high velocity. The problem is that you can just use stasis on the ball, hit it a few times, and the switch is immediately pressed without you ever having to worry. Then you use the tilt on movable platforms, which is just a novel use of the damn thing, right? This got me really bummed out, especially because I completed the dungeon, again, in about 15 minutes. Von Aboris was my next dungeon, and it gave me a slight bit of hope. This was the first time I was intrigued by the applications of the central mechanic, which is to rotate three cylinders around in the belly of the beast. There were several rotation options for each of the three notches, each of which affected the dungeon in some way. If you lined all three up correctly, it would activate one segment near the top where you need to run a current of electricity. But you need to link up those lines after you reach a wall, because it causes that segment of the dungeon to raise, and you need to get behind that wall so you can then use it as a platform. This is the first hint of a divine beast forcing you to use the central mechanic so far removed from the middle of the dungeon. It promotes thought beyond the surface level applications, and it sparks more thought into how it changes the dungeon overall. 
That said, the dungeon still doesn't link the central mechanic into all of its puzzle solving, only the central few puzzles. The top segment of the dungeon is compelling in its own right, but it has nothing to do with the rest of the dungeon. You need to get two metal balls to the middle portion of the dungeon to activate two electric switches. It's difficult, but it's removed from the central mechanic, and I feel the same way about another puzzle near the rear of the dungeon, which involves lining up two wheels to activate switches with a current of electricity and raise a segment of the dungeon. Again, it's pretty far removed from the central mechanic, and because of that, it's hard for the dungeon to feel like it warrants being a dungeon instead of a collection of shrine puzzles that rarely interact with one another. The major issue is that most of the puzzles aren't tied to the central mechanic, and if they are in the case of Va Mado, those puzzles are too surface level for them to feel satisfying to solve. The freedom to solve any of the puzzles in any order I please does increase the replayability of the dungeons quite significantly, but if none of the puzzles are satisfying to complete in the first place, why bother? By Va Rudanya, the game was still telling me how to complete the dungeon. Daruk lets me know that I need to get a map of the dungeon first, and then activate four or five Sheikah pedestals hidden behind a few puzzles. I do not need this spelled out to me every time I visit a dungeon, it's maddening. I know they can't account for you to visit any one dungeon first, but that's no excuse for the game constantly explaining how the dungeon works when it's the same across every dungeon. This is especially appalling because a skip button exists for cutscenes and other tutorials in the game itself, so I don't understand why you can't skip this beginning segment of the dungeon. Varudania itself isn't nearly as impressive as Van Boris. The beginning was interesting because I hadn't dealt with Pitch Black before, and truly felt lost until I found the map. This is when the dungeon lights up and you can move it 90 degrees to the right, and then back to its resting position. It's initially cool to turn the beast over and watch the dungeon turn around, but this is never more complex than get ball into track, turn the dungeon back around for the ball to fall down this other segment of the track, then lift up this metal doorway, and then woo, you solved it. There's one puzzle that literally just involves burning foliage to open a door. What does this puzzle test? I really don't get it. I had a cool moment where the dungeon taught me to light arrows by moving over a fire while the arrow is cocked, and I only knew to do that because of the robust logic system. That's really cool, but it has nothing to do with the rest of the dungeon, and once you figure out how to do it, the puzzle waiting for you inside is a piece of cake. Just take a metal box, put it over the fire, and turn the dungeon to its side. That's all you have to do here. Imagine if you could move Varudania in all four directions. Then you could add more puzzles that involve you having to switch between the directions in several different ways. Maybe you'll have to switch two directions and then back two directions in the middle of a puzzle. You can add a bit of timing-based movement to this. It's incredibly disappointing because I was looking forward to the unique idea they had for dungeons this time around. They mentioned the idea that the dungeons would be more about traversal than puzzle solving, which got me excited. Turns out they really just meant that it's about changing the dungeon itself and solving a bunch of simple, disconnected puzzles that go by in about 15 minutes depending on your playstyle. Even Van Boris, once you get over the initial learning curve of the central mechanic and the variety of options it has, is nothing special. It's definitely not one of my favorite dungeons in the series, because it's over too quickly and not all of its puzzles make effective use of that central mechanic. It's just the best of the four dungeons Breath of the Wild has to offer. The solution I posit to this lack of puzzle complexity is to reduce the number of shrines you can visit, increase the number of dungeons you can find, and increase the length of those dungeons. Would anyone really be complaining if they had 70 shrines instead of 120, each more on the side of environmental riddle shrines than individual puzzle shrines? And then save some of the puzzle solving for each of the dungeons, which could be longer because they don't have so much time devoted to shrine puzzles, and could have a logical ramp up in complexity since they can keep you locked in the dungeon. They should limit the number of individual puzzles you solve in each dungeon, because the more puzzles you have to solve, the less of a chance there is for that puzzle to be complex, because it can't warrant the time necessary to gradually ramp up in the same way as puzzles in previous Zelda dungeons. It doesn't have to be designed in a strictly linear fashion, and I think I prefer the non-linearity of Breath of the Wild's dungeons, I just think the lack of depth in each of them completely ruined the dungeons for me. And really, would anyone complain if you culled some of the side content? The side quests in general are just to go collect bear asses most of the time. I understand quests like Terrytown are very fascinating and quite humorous near the end, but most of the other side quests are just meaningless fetch quests, it's kind of odd to see in a Zelda game. 
You can keep a few of the standouts, but honestly, side quests really should just be limited to the shrine quests. I don't understand why they're in different categories to begin with. I can even add to my solution by tweaking the dungeons just a little bit. I think Hyrule Castle is a great example of a type of dungeon I wish to see more of. This place is focused less on puzzle elements and more on actual dungeon crawling. There are high level monsters everywhere, secret passages to hidden bosses and items hidden every which way, and you can explore any segment of the dungeon you want at your own pace. This takes the impressive non-linearity of the dungeon design and places it in an environment where it takes advantage of the deeper combat system by providing you with some very tough challenges to overcome and littering the castle with secret areas to find behind bookcases or breakable walls. What's ironic about this new type of dungeon is that compared to each of the dungeons in the franchise, it's the most similar to a dungeon in the traditional sense of an RPG where you fight monsters and loot treasure. The difficulty of the dungeons is linked to the monsters within it, and the satisfaction comes from fully exploring it for treasure to use on your adventure. Now, I'm not suggesting we go full-on Hyrule Castle and abandon the traditional dungeon elements, but there could be a mix of the two. The simple, individual puzzles would actually work much better if they were spliced into Hyrule Castle, as long as those puzzles weren't necessarily required for progression. You could use a simple puzzle, like moving the two metal balls in Va Naboris, but use it for a one-off secret area with treasure. Dungeons like Hyrule Castle don't necessarily need puzzle depth, they just need a tough variety of monsters to fight and a ton of secret areas to make the dungeon worth exploring. This is definitely where the sequel should take dungeon design alongside the traditional dungeon. I've always thought traditional 3D Zelda dungeons worked fine enough, but when compared to the original Zelda in particular, there was always a heavier focus on puzzle solving more than there was on combat. This was likely because the combat system was so underdeveloped. But now that Breath of the Wild has built a very robust, varied combat system, I think it's time to shirk that tradition. Breath of the Wild already flies in the face of the very linear design of previous 3D Zeldas. Why can't it also shirk the sense that dungeons need to be a set of puzzles? While we're at it, I think Breath of the Wild suffers not only from having only four dungeons, but having them all be so boring to enter. I mentioned before there's a recognizable pattern to fighting each of the divine beasts before entering them, but this boredom goes much further than simply fighting them. There's a significant amount of time before that fight dedicated to the town in which the beast resides. For instance, in Goron City you spend a fair amount of time fucking around looking for a Unobo in an offshoot section of Death Mountain until you find him and send him back to Goron City. Then you go with Unobo to a bridge which opens the way up to the Divine Beast and you start your fight with him. Relatively harmless, but not very exciting, especially because Unobo, as a character, <laughs> well, he's not terribly interesting. He's the stereotypical wimpy kid, and I'm sorry, his voice acting? Oh. Oh man, what am I gonna do? Monsters! They're here! They found me! Help! This is the first Zelda game to use voice acting, but they don't actually use it that often. Only in a few select scenes, and it's almost always average at best. Rivali is pretty okay. Couldn't easily dispense with Ganon. Now then, my ability to explore the firmament is certainly of note. But let's not, pardon me for being so blunt, let's not forget the fact that I am the most skilled archer of all the Rito. But Zelda... Well... Uh, people are gonna kill me for this. I'm sorry, she tries way too hard. I never heard them. The voices from the spirit realm. And Mother said her own power would develop within me. But I don't hear or feel anything. It's not like she sounds bad necessarily, but I really couldn't connect with her character all that well because it felt like she was trying to force an accent and her line delivery felt so unnatural to me. It's not really a huge issue overall since you can skip cutscenes, but it's a shame there's so little voice acting and that a lot of it is mediocre, especially since reviews have been hyping the game up because it's the first Zelda to have voice acting. The story content in general is fairly lackluster because it isn't prioritized very much. The story is relegated to an exposition dump by King Rome, the dungeon segments where you speak with long dead guardians, and the optional cutscenes you can find across the world. 
The optional cutscenes are supposed to be the real meat, but I don't think it goes into enough depth for the story to feel meaningful. The relationship between Link and Zelda is interesting, with Zelda feeling shoehorned into a destiny she wants nothing to do with, and growing more fond of Link as the game goes on. The ability to uncover this in any order and at your own pace is the real draw, and making it optional is a step in the right direction. Despite any of my thoughts on the story content, you don't have to experience it. That doesn't necessarily excuse the fact that I don't think Zelda is as complex as a lot of people believe she is. In so many of these scenes, it feels like they're really trying to hammer you over the head with the point in such a small amount of runtime. Like, I get it. Zelda is rebellious, doesn't want to do what her father asks, but oh no, surprise, her kingdom is attacked when they left on bad terms. Now Zelda regrets what she did and has to seal Link away. Yeah, real fucking original. Look, it's not offensive or anything, but we just don't get enough time to truly connect with these people, especially the champions. I think I called them guardians earlier. Whatever, I'm not going to fucking edit that out. I, they're champions. So these four champions that accompany Link each represent the various races. There's Arito, Goron, Zora, and Gerudo. I like all of their character archetypes, but I can't say I care for many of their characters. All we really establish is that Daruk is very happy-go-lucky Goron, he's basically a carbon copy of Darunia from Ocarina of Time. Rivali is kind of an arrogant dickhead, and all his character really amounts to is cocky snarking. Urbosa is the stereotypical, I'm stoic and I don't talk very much and I'm a proud Gerudo warrior type. Mifa is very cute and she's sort of the innocent, I'll heal everyone sort of nice girl. Yeah, I like them all, but we just don't get enough time with them. The champions in particular, you get two scenes with them in their city and then a few scenes with them where they're all together when you're looking for the optional cutscenes. But each of these cutscenes are, at max, two minutes long. It's just not enough time. I just don't think I'll ever get around to finding the optional cutscenes on any of my multiple playthroughs because there are, like, two scenes I feel are worthy of watching over again. This one where they're taking pictures of stuff is cute, I admit, and I like watching it, but the rest feel like a waste of time. If you find Zelda's diary in Hyrule Castle, you pretty much get a wiki summary of the story. Zelda doesn't like her role, she doesn't like Link, but over time she accepts her role, and grows fond of Link. I mean, it's pretty cool that they explain Link's silence as a type of almost war trauma or something, but that's about all I find super interesting here. The ending rang so hollow because I just didn't care. Saving Zelda, slaying Ganon, it all just felt like a formality. All that said, it's almost a non-issue for me because I never cared about Zelda's story much to begin with, and since you can functionally skip the story segments, you won't see me dying on this hill. What I will give the game credit for is a fantastic sense of world building. It's established fairly early on that thousands of years ago a ton of guardian robots were made to fight Calamity Ganon, along with the four divine beasts. They seem to be doing their job well for at least 900 years until the latest attempt at sealing away Ganon, where he took control of the Guardians and infested Hyrule Castle and the Divine Beasts. This idea that Link and company failed 100 years ago is a fascinating setup for an almost post-apocalyptic world. It's not that extreme because the world still feels very lived in. The various races mostly keep to themselves, but each wander Hyrule in different locations. It also means that you can find humans in Goron City on occasion, or even Gorons in Zora's Domain. The Gerudo also let women of all races into Gerudo Town. Then there's the realistic environment construction, paired with the ability to climb anything and everything. Imagine if you took the world of Twilight Princess, but you could climb everything. It would immediately heighten the scope, and Breath of the Wild's world is even bigger than Twilight Princess's, so you can imagine the effect it has on immersion. Mountain ranges, several snow fields, even one in the desert region. There's a more tropical setting with a fishing village, and of course, Death Mountain, Zoro's Domain, a Rito village very reminiscent of Dragon Roost Island. The Rito being back is cool, but it also kind of confuses me a little bit. Weren't the Rito an evolved form of the Zora? Honestly, I'm willing to let them retcon the Wind Waker to have more races. It really never made a whole lot of sense anyway that the Zora evolved into birds when they'd thrive in the Great Sea. 
One thing Breath of the Wild does to differentiate the different races is make them look just a little bit different than each other. The Rito are all different types of birds, some look like big owls, some look like falcons and whatnot. Some Zoras look like stingrays or sharks or regular fish. Gorons have different types of beards and body shapes, I really like this. It might seem like a simple touch, but not having the same race copy pasted over and over again and called a different name does a number on the immersion. I mean, you sort of just get used to it in Wind Waker when all of the Rito postmen look the exact fucking same, but you have to admit it's a little bit ridiculous. Anyway, what I like most about Hyrule is the quaint atmosphere. It isn't a sense of dread, destruction, or sadness. I wouldn't even say it's a sense of happiness. It's more a silent beauty. There are parts of the world that are left unexplained. In a side quest to go after leviathan bones, you never really learn what the leviathans were or why they went extinct. Similarly, when you visit a lost temple hidden away in a ravine, you wonder what purpose it once served. Now it's infested with guardians, but you'll always have that curiosity lingering in the back of your mind. What was this place all about? This is the only reason the linear story progression doesn't severely impact the game for me, but it does wrestle with a few of its conceits. I suppose the problem I have with this linear story focus is that it has a tendency to fuck around with the build up to the dungeons. It's a lot like previous Zelda games, there's always an outside build up with a particular race and some weird shit they have you go do. In Gerudo Town you have to go raid the Yaiga hideout, which is a cool version of the Gerudo Pirate Fortress or Elden Volcano segment in Majora and Skyward Sword respectively. I mean you distract the Yaiga with fucking mighty bananas, what more could you ask for? And while the fight against their leader, Koga, is easy, it's pretty funny, and the music is catchy as all hell. I also think the way you finish him off is hilarious. I don't really have a problem with this type of a build-up, but this happens for every dungeon. In Zora's Domain, as much as I love Sidon, the way up to Zora's Domain is littered with interruption after interruption of Sidon telling you, Oh, you don't have much further to go, don't worry, bye. It's really annoying, and I can tell they didn't want to go too extreme in abandoning tradition. They wanted this story aspect to remain so you could see all the Zora that hate you because Mipha died, and it also lets you have that cool interaction with the Lionel. But I think what would have been far more effective in this case, and what wouldn't clash with the freer nature of the game, is to make the dungeons discoverable in the same way shrines are. Do we really need a story build up for every dungeon? I think it's fine for a few to have a unique bit of story to them, I'm not suggesting we abandon this progression altogether. I'm just saying, wouldn't it be much cooler if the dungeons were discoverable? As it stands, they are technically discoverable, but Impa also tells you where they all are, so it's kinda hard to ignore even after you turn off the yellow dots telling you where to go. And when all of them are so linear, it feels disconnected with the themes of freedom and discovery. Really, I'm just suggesting the same system, but add three or four extra dungeons that you have to go find on your own, instead of littering the world with a bunch of one-off shrines that are hit or miss to begin with. Ask yourself what's more exciting, finding a dungeon hidden away somewhere with a level of quality similar to Hyrule Castle, or one little forgettable shrine. This system of dungeons would be a brilliant compromise between the new and the old. You can have your traditional story-focused dungeons, but litter the world with a few more dungeons that are hidden away. If we keep the shrines you solve in the environment and throw out a few of the simple puzzles inside of the shrines, and definitely throw out the tests of strength, you could use that remaining space to develop a bunch of hidden dungeons. Each of them could be like Hyrule Castle, some more focused on puzzle solving, and some more focused on combat. Hell, a few of them could be focused on puzzle solving entirely, and a few of them could be focused on combat entirely. I don't even care. As long as that variety exists, I'm sure it'll be fine. With a system like this in place, you could equip players with the runes at the start of the game, and develop simple puzzles surrounding your base moveset, because they'll mostly be in dungeons that have new redeeming qualities outside of their puzzles. There'll be monsters to fight, secrets to find, and the act of finding each dungeon would now be tied into the theme of discovery, and it'll be much more satisfying than finding one lone shrine. I wouldn't do away with the concept of shrines, because they work for what they are, I just think a particular type of shrine works much better than the others. This 
is just a simple next step the series could take, and I wanted to lay this out to prove to people that Breath of the Wild is definitely no masterpiece. There are too many flaws present for me to ignore, despite how much I love the core conceit of the game. The durability system is way too extreme, the difficulty balancing is pretty wonky, the bosses and dungeons aren't incredibly satisfying, there are issues with Breath of the Wild, and I want to see them fixed for the sequel. But I have to say, the core of the game really captured me, and I still feel the urge to play the game even after I've found every shrine, beaten every dungeon, watched every cutscene, and beaten Ganon. I still have the urge to replay it and do different stuff first, find different solutions to puzzles, fight enemies with the more complex and varied combat system. There's something about traversal in this game that will never get old. The scope of the world is so impressive. There's always something to find, something to strive toward. Breath of the Wild is the best open world I've ever had the pleasure of exploring because it gives you a limitless set of options as to how to get lost in Hyrule, any which way you please. Having such a wide variety of options makes discovering something all the more meaningful, even when that discovery isn't always backed up by finding a hard puzzle or a difficult boss. It's also the stories you craft while playing that keep me engaged. I'm constantly learning new things about the very robust physics engine, and because of this immense level of player freedom, you craft your own unique stories to tell your friends. I've shared with you some of mine, like finding Faroche for the first time, or trying to solve the Constellation Shrine. My friends have some unique stories as well, like braving the snowfields by eating mushrooms to keep themselves alive, or mounting a fucking bear to ride around the Alps just because they can do it. This confidence in the player goes a long way towards crafting an incredibly satisfying adventure in a non-linear fashion. It's very similar to how Twilight Princess makes effective use of its linear progression to craft an epic adventure. The way I see it, it's a yin-yang. Twilight Princess has fantastic dungeon design, an amazing story, great world building, and a fantastic sense of pacing to encourage replayability. Breath of the Wild has an immense level of player freedom, with a robust combat and physics system, and a sense of discovery like no other game I've ever played. But both of them have their pitfalls. Twilight Princess might have an impressive overworld when compared to other Zelda games, but it lacks a satisfying amount of content in that overworld compared to other games in general. Not all of the dungeon items have a wide use case, and the combat, while deeper than the Zeldas before it, isn't particularly difficult or engaging. Whereas the pitfalls of Breath of the Wild come in a lackluster selection of dungeons, a flawed durability system, a less engaging story, and a slight problem with the difficulty balancing. They both have their strengths, and both craft an adventure worth remembering and reliving for different reasons. Twilight Princess for those epic replayable moments and fantastic dungeons, and Breath of the Wild for an infinite number of stories you can craft on your own by exploring the world a different way each time you revisit it. They are the pinnacle of Zelda, and I suppose if you had me at gunpoint, I would prefer Breath of the Wild over Twilight Princess. Then again, tomorrow if you held me at gunpoint, maybe I'd prefer Twilight Princess over Breath of the Wild. It's hard to say. For right now, I just pine this sense of freedom, and since the world is constructed so incredibly well, traversing it is always fun for me. Finding shrines, enemy camps, it's just fun to explore, and I don't think I'm going to get tired of Hyrule anytime soon. It's a fantastic example of an open world game that justifies the existence of its open world to promote thorough exploration and reward you with a childlike sense of wondrous discovery. So I guess by technicality, Breath of the Wild is now my favorite Zelda game, but not by a significant margin. I don't think this game is necessarily as amazing as most people are making it out to be. It has some slight problems, but this is certainly a direction the series has needed to take for a while. I love Zelda, but even I have to admit 3D Zelda in particular falls victim to its own weird staples. The companion character, the easy difficulty, the flawed combat system, the hand-holding. They were only saved because they had fun dungeons or a tightly paced linear progression, which is the reason why I don't really enjoy The Wind Waker, because it lacked those elements for me. I think the best way to look at Breath of the Wild is less of a Zelda masterpiece and more of a step Zelda has needed to take for a long time. Gone are the days of obtuse progression, hand-holding, easy difficulty. This is a new age of Zelda, an incredible foundation for the future of the series. 
It's up to all of us to let Nintendo know what we don't like about this new formula so they can make it better. Trust me, if the next four Zelda games mimic the progression of the last five Zelda games, people are gonna get really unhappy with the formula. And that's because the change between 3D Zelda isn't as significant as most other games. At the end of the day, comparing Ocarina of Time to Skyward Sword, they're very similar in execution. Of course, there are some obvious combat improvements and visual improvements and some dungeon improvements, but they're largely very similar. And imagine if we get four more Zelda games that feel just like Breath of the Wild. Eventually, that'll get old. And you know how we stop that? We need to tell Nintendo what's wrong with this formula so we don't make the same mistake twice. Zelda games always get reviewed universally well, and I think that's a mistake. Not because Zelda is bad, not because I don't like Zelda, but because we need to see this series improve substantially. Zelda can be much better than it currently is, and though I enjoy pretty much every Zelda game, we need a truly excellent Zelda game to come out of the fold, and I think a sequel to Breath of the Wild, with all of the improvements I mentioned to all of the problems I see with the game, oh man, it would be magical. I'm excited to see what comes next. I really hope Nintendo takes the time to listen to some of the, I guess, lesser spoken criticisms. And really, that's the point of my video. My point isn't to be a negative Nancy just for the sake of it. I want the best for all of us. Just keep that in mind. In the meantime, though, I'm gonna go get my Switch because Hyrule beckons for me to explore it a thousand times over, and I couldn't be happier to accept that proposal. In regards to the video at hand, I hope you agree with me, but if you don't, feel free to leave a comment below. I'm always willing to have a discussion about anything. All you have to do is ask. If you liked the video, feel free to give it a thumbs up, and if you didn't like it, feel free to give it a thumbs down. All I ask is that you tell me why you liked or didn't like it, so I can take that feedback and improve myself, my content, and my channel. Thank you for watching, my name is Ben King K, and I certainly hope you have some well-deserved fun today.